Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Mason, and today I'm going to talk about how your diet could help you survive a coronavirus infection. We see a broad spectrum in the severity of symptoms brought about by coronavirus. It seems that about 15% of cases will be quite severe, while the other 85% may only experience mild symptoms. In fact, some research suggests that some people may be completely unaware they've even had the infection. So why can some people shake it off with barely a sore throat while others end up in hospital? Well, pre-existing health conditions are a major factor and four keep on coming up. Diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and high blood pressure. And this study found that these four conditions were associated with a significantly increased risk of severe coronavirus infection. For example, having a history of either diabetes or heart disease led to a one in five chance of ending up in ICU if you were admitted to hospital. And while it's absolutely true that age is a major risk factor for dying from coronavirus, I would contend that age is a major risk factor only because it is associated with other health conditions. That is, as people get older, they tend to get sicker. Nothing too controversial about that. But what if you could age healthily? Would the risk to a healthy 80 year old be less than an unhealthy 60 year old? I would argue yes, and it doesn't matter what age you are, you can almost certainly improve your health, and fairly rapidly as you'll soon see. And the corollary is also true. Younger people who are less healthy are also more vulnerable, and this is reflected in the data. Not only are we seeing unexpected numbers of coronavirus infecting young people, but it appears to be directly correlated with poorer metabolic health. So what exactly is poor metabolic health and why is it so important? Well, good metabolic health is defined as having good measurements across five metrics, blood glucose, blood pressure, body fat, blood triglycerides, and HDL cholesterol. A suboptimal level on any one of these is not only associated with conditions such as diabetes and heart disease, but also impaired immunity that is, a reduced ability to fight off infection. The various effects of metabolic syndrome on the immune system are far too numerous to cover individually, but the combined effect is significant, and this leads to vulnerability to infection, and this no doubt includes coronavirus. And the key thing to understand about metabolic syndrome is that while it has several different features, they all share the same root cause, and that is, insulin resistance. Insulin is a hormone that naturally circulates around our body, and without it, we would die. And insulin resistance refers to our body being resistant to the effects of insulin. In other words, the insulin we have doesn't work as well as it should. So to compensate, if it can, your body will release more insulin. So insulin resistance is often characterized by very high levels of insulin and it is the major risk factor for metabolic syndrome, leading to high blood sugars, high triglycerides, high blood pressure, high levels of body fat, and a lowering of the good HDL cholesterol. And carbohydrate rich foods, which cause our body to release significant amounts of insulin can directly contribute to insulin resistance. In other words, high carbohydrate diets can cause metabolic syndrome. Likewise, low carbohydrate diets can help treat metabolic syndrome. So then, you might be wondering if you yourself are metabolically healthy. Well, statistically speaking, probably not. That is, if you're reflective of a typical adult. This study found that only 12% of American adults were metabolically healthy based on the five criteria for metabolic syndrome. And even the figures for young adults weren't that pretty. Less than a quarter of adults under the age of 40 were healthy but the numbers were particularly grim for the over 60s, with only 2% getting a passing grade in all five metrics. But there are also degrees of metabolic ill health, and as metabolic disease progresses, obvious external signs may appear. The most obvious of these is perhaps obesity, which can easily and accurately be assessed with waist circumference. Skin tags also have a strong association with insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, as does the increased skin pigmentation seen in acanthosis nigricans. 
Another sign I always look for in my clinic patients is this, called pitting edema. If after pressing firmly over the shin, a dimple is left behind, this may be an indication that the heart is beginning to fail. Basically, if the heart is not pumping properly, the pressure in the blood vessels that feed into the heart increases, and this allows fluid from the blood vessels to seep into the surrounding tissues. And when you press on this waterlogged tissue, you can displace some of this fluid, creating a depression that is left behind. Pitting edema might just present as something like prominent sock marks. And while heart failure is not the only cause of pitting edema, if you have it, it would be well worth your while visiting your doctor. Let's now take a closer look at coronavirus and how it can infect us. It usually enters the body on virus-laden droplets where it deposits in the throat. That the symptoms of coronavirus infection often begin with a sore throat reflect this. And if the virus progress can be halted here, the person will likely recover with few issues. These are often the mild cases. If, however, the virus descends further down the windpipe, it can spread throughout the body and cause some damage. And the ability of the virus to spread unchecked is very dependent on both the virus ability to enter our cells and the effectiveness of our immune system in combating it. When it comes to entering our cells, coronavirus needs an entry point. And that entry point is something called angiotensin converting enzyme 2 protein. And insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes increase the number of these entry points and not just in the airways but various other tissues around the body including the liver and the heart. And as an aside, smoking also increases the expression of this protein. So if you've been waiting for a reason to quit, here it is. So once coronavirus has managed to enter our cells, we basically become reliant on our immune systems to clear it. And this study, published in Nature last year, elegantly demonstrates how the immune response is impaired with insulin resistance. When we get infected with a virus, a key factor in the immune response is the release of various small proteins called growth factors and cytokines, which communicate between different cells and basically rally the troops. And this study looked at many of these growth factors and cytokines in response to viral infections. And as shown on this heat map, we can see that the upregulation varies significantly between them. Now, certain of these are particularly important in coordinating the defense against viral infection. And here are five which are critical to the viral immune response. And you can see the response was significantly attenuated in the insulin resistant subjects when we compare it to those subjects who were healthy. And this is why the authors concluded that insulin resistance led to an impairment of immune system function. Now you may have also heard about something called a cytokine storm, where excess production of cytokines leads to uncontrolled inflammation, which can be fatal. And certainly cytokines have been linked to mortality with coronavirus infections. But the interesting thing is that the initial cytokine response between healthy individuals and insulin resistant individuals is quite similar. But there is an inappropriate persistence of elevated cytokine levels in insulin resistant subjects. Even after supposed recovery from infection, and it may be that this indicates an increased propensity for a cytokine storm. And remember, the subjects in this study still had normal blood sugar levels. They were not yet diabetic, just insulin resistant. But when insulin resistance gets bad enough that blood sugar starts to rise, there are other impacts on the immune system. For example, glucose can attach to a type of immune cell called natural killer cells impairing their function. And these natural killer cells provide a major line of defense against viral infections. Here you can see that as natural killer cells are damaged by glycation products, 
their function was driven into the ground. Not good if you're trying to fight an infection. And these immune suppressing effects of insulin resistance and elevated blood sugar levels explain the high rate of diabetes amongst coronavirus victims. This Italian study found that of 355 patients who died, 35.5% of them were diabetic, a massively disproportionate representation. There is some good news here though. It's possible to improve your blood sugar levels literally overnight, simply by changing your diet. You see, most of the sugar in our blood is directly from ingested carbohydrates, which are quite literally made of sugar molecules. So if we stop eating carbs, we stop putting the sugar into our circulation. This graph here shows in practical terms what happened to the morning blood sugar levels of a 71 year old diabetic when he followed this advice. Overnight, he had a big drop in his sugar, quite literally halving his morning sugar readings in the space of two weeks. We can see on day one here, he started with a blood sugar level of 13.7 and by 14 days, it was down to 7.1. And this was at the same time as he stopped his two diabetic medications, the glucoside and metformin. And this large study here confirmed the ability of low carb diets to reverse diabetes over the longer term. At two years, 53% of low carb subjects no longer had diabetes. In addition to blood sugar, the two other blood markers of metabolic syndrome are triglyceride levels and HDL cholesterol. And both of these move in the right direction on a low carb diet. The triglycerides go down and HDL cholesterol goes up. Some of you though might be concerned about the effect of low carb diets on something called LDL cholesterol. And indeed, LDL cholesterol often does increase on low carb, high fat diets. This, however, isn't necessarily a problem. There's a very good reason why it isn't included in the criteria for metabolic syndrome, and that's because high levels don't really matter. Take this systematic review, which examined 19 cohort studies with over 68,000 participants. 16 of these studies found an inverse relationship between LDL cholesterol and all cause mortality. That is, the higher your LDL, the lower your chance of dying. And things get even more interesting when we look specifically at infection risk versus cholesterol levels, because cholesterol appears to be protective against infection. For instance, this recent paper found that patients with the lowest LDL levels were almost 50% more likely to suffer uncontrolled infection than those with the highest level. And interestingly enough, this seemed to reflect the association of high LDL levels with good metabolic health as the strength of this finding was reduced after controlling for variables of poor metabolic health, like diabetes. Likewise, this study also reported the finding that low cholesterol levels were associated with increased mortality from infection in the elderly. And this graph from a cohort study of more than 30,000 adults found that those with the lowest LDL level had a 30% greater chance of ending up with uncontrolled infections, known as sepsis, compared to those with the highest levels of LDL. And this recent meta-analysis from earlier this year found that high HDL cholesterol levels are protective against dying from infection. Whichever way you slice it or dice it, it appears higher cholesterol levels, including total cholesterol, HDL and LDL, are protective against infection. And not only do low cholesterol levels increase the risk of infection, infections also lower cholesterol levels. And this has been known for over 100 years, with the severity of infection also paralleling the degree of cholesterol reduction. These graphs show the cholesterol levels of a female coronavirus patient, which demonstrate a continuous drop following hospitalization, and then increases as she recovered. Another one of the metabolic syndrome metrics is obesity. And this study found that obesity increased the risk of severe pneumonia with coronavirus by three and a half times. In fact, 
of 383 patients needing admission to hospital, 43% of them were either overweight or obese. And impaired immune function is a key player in this. Take this study which looked at the potency of the immune response to influenza vaccination. What we see is that the ability of healthy people to mount an immune response was far greater than that of people who were either overweight or obese. And if obesity impairs the immune system, plenty of Australians ought to be concerned. As shown here, more than two thirds of Australian adults are either overweight or obese. And this is only slightly less than in the US where about 70% of adults are overweight or obese. And the type of obesity that is most dangerous is called visceral obesity, which refers to fat around our organs and it directly relates to insulin resistance and diabetes. In fact, for every one kilogram increase in visceral fat, the risk of diabetes in males doubles and for females, it quadruples. Process that for a second. As a female, if you were to have one extra kilogram of visceral fat, your risk of diabetes would be increased by four times. But the good news is that when we lose weight on a low carbohydrate diet, it is the visceral fat that gets lost first. This means just losing a few kilograms is enough to significantly improve your health. Take this patient of mine here. Compare the amount of fat concentrated around his liver before he commenced a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, and then following a modest nine kilogram weight loss. He was still significantly overweight, but I can tell you that all the markers of his metabolic health had significantly improved. And it might surprise you to learn that visceral fat around their abdominal organs is also mirrored in the tongue. Yes, fat deposition in the tongue. And this explains why obesity is the primary risk factor for sleep apnea, because as the tongue gets bigger, the chance of occluding the airway when the throat muscles relax as you sleep is greatly increased. And sleep apnea increases the chance of ending up in ICU with the flu by about five times. Here you can see how weight loss led to a dramatic reduction in not only the visceral fat around the abdomen, but also the fat within the tongue. And I've got literally dozens of patients who've been able to stop using the CPAP breathing masks they need for sleep apnea after losing weight on low carbohydrate diets. And there is no doubt that low carbohydrate diets are the best diet for weight loss. Between 2003 and 2018, there were 62 randomized controlled trials comparing low fat diets and low carbohydrate diets in terms of weight loss. 31 of these had statistically significant results, and here I have charted all of them. No cherry picking. The blue bars represent the amount of weight loss in the low carb group, and the adjacent red bar the amount of weight loss in the low fat group. And if you look at each pair of results, you'll see that the low carb groups lost more weight in every single study. And research demonstrates that weight loss benefits the functioning of the immune system. This study found that T cell function, very important in the defense against viruses, improved significantly following weight loss. We can see the baseline levels here and what happens after weight loss in the black bars. Indeed, some research even indicates that fasting may assist some of the immune system functions. This study found significant improvement in the activity of natural killer cells and antibody levels, which we can see were much higher in the fasting group. And this is in keeping with the Minnesota starvation experiment by Ansel Keys, which found respiratory infections didn't increase in starved subjects over 24 weeks. And this observation has also been made that high carbohydrate refeeding by way of grains after periods of starvation can lead to an exacerbation of latent infections. 
Indeed, in patients requiring non-invasive ventilation, which basically means breathing support without having a tube down your throat, if you were unable to eat normally, then fasting for 48 hours seemed to lead to better outcomes than artificial tube feeding. But the benefits of weight loss on immune function have not been universally documented, as in this paper which found impairment of immune function following 12 weeks of a severely calorie restricted high carbohydrate diet. I do suspect, however, that this effect primarily relates to the effect of carbohydrates inducing insulin release and the subsequent effect this has on energy availability. That is, even though you may be ingesting energy, a high insulin response can prevent you, and by proxy, your immune system from accessing it. And evidence for this partitioning of energy related to the role of insulin was elegantly shown in this paper. You can see that in the low carb group here, there was much more energy availability when compared to the high carb group, to the tune of about 278 kilojoules a day, about as much as you'd burn with an hour long bike ride. Let's now look at the final metric for metabolic disease, high blood pressure. This study found that high blood pressure or hypertension was associated with a 6% fatality rate following coronavirus infection. And the key thing to understand is that this high blood pressure, which is considered to be a problem, is not due to excessive sodium intake, as is commonly thought, but high levels of insulin, again, often driven by high carbohydrate diets. And the reason is that insulin actually causes the kidneys to hold on to sodium. You can see here four transporters which are all activated under the influence of insulin to cause the body to retain sodium. And this is why essential hypertension, which is the name given to the most common form of high blood pressure, is considered to be an insulin dependent disorder. It only exists if insulin levels are high. And you can see how the chance of developing high blood pressure over a four year period was much greater in those with high insulin levels than it was in those with low insulin levels. So if you're one of the increasing numbers of Australians with high blood pressure, now might be a good time to consider a low carbohydrate diet. And I'd offer a word of caution to anyone considering restricting sodium intake. This paper published in 2014 looked at the urinary sodium excretion of more than 100,000 subjects. And they found that when the level of sodium excretion, which closely reflects intake, was less than four to six grams a day, the risk of dying increased sharply. And this is equivalent to about 10 to 15 grams of table salt quite a lot. So then, it seems pretty clear that controlling carbs will not only help your metabolic health, but also your immune system. And with the spectre of coronavirus around us, that can only be a good thing. And one of the most effective ways to start with is to get a continuous glucose monitor. Communicating wireless or with your phone, they can provide real-time blood sugar levels, providing you with immediate feedback on the impact of different foods on your sugar levels. And once you know what foods and drinks cause instability of your sugar levels, it won't be long before you can get control. Obviously, you'll need to replace the carbs with something, and foods that contain both protein and fat are ideal. Not only will it help your cholesterol levels, which have been associated with reduced risk of infectious diseases, but the amino acids, which make up protein, will also support your immune system. But please make sure you don't use any oils when cooking. And this includes olive oil. Solid animal fats such as lard and tallow are a much better choice. And the reason for this is that liquid fats or oils are only liquid because they have double bonds which are prone to oxidation. Here you can see that oils, even olive oil, produce far more toxic compounds when cooking when compared to lard. And don't think you can get away with using oils if you don't heat them. 
Here you can see the progressive oxidation of walnut oil over a period of just eight days. And we now understand how these oxidized products can be absorbed into the tissues of our body, including our liver, and contribute to disease. And the medical evidence is clear that saturated fats are healthier than unsaturated oils. There have been more than 10 systematic reviews and meta-analyses on this topic, and on balance they find in favour of saturated fat. And in the pool of evidence, there are also three large, long-term, randomised controlled trials which find in favour of saturated fat. Let's take a closer look. The Sydney Diet Heart Study was conducted from 1966 to 1973 and was a randomised controlled trial examining the effect of replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat in men. While it was well performed, for some inexplicable reason, the full results were not initially published. Fortunately, in 2013, some 40 years after the study was completed, the full results were finally published after the original data was recovered from old magnetic tapes stored in a basement. And the findings? Those on the polyunsaturated fat diet were 62% more likely to die than those in the saturated fat group. Also of the same era was, was this study, which ran between 1968 to 1973. This was a double-blinded, randomised controlled trial on more than 9,000 men and women, comparing a high saturated fat diet with a high unsaturated fat diet. But after completion, it took another 16 years to publish, and even then, certain details were missing. Why the delay in publishing? Well, in the words of the study's now deceased lead author, it was because the findings were disappointing. That is, they didn't get the results they wanted. And it should probably be pointed out that Ansel Keys, the father of the diet heart hypothesis, was a co-investigator in this study. Fortunately again, however, the original study data in entirety was able to be recovered with the complete findings finally published in 2016. The major finding, that while replacing saturated fat with vegetable oil did indeed lower blood cholesterol levels, those participants with the greatest reductions in cholesterol had an increase in their risk of death. And moving into modern times, we have the infamous Women's Health Initiative study, a massive study of over 48,000 females who were randomised to either a low fat or a control group. This study really should be considered the final nail in the coffin for the diet heart hypothesis. Although from reading the study, this is not immediately obvious. You see, the only statistically significant finding of this 700 million US dollar study was omitted from the results section. And this finding was that females in the low fat group had an increased risk of complications like heart attacks if they had a prior history of cardiovascular disease. And the increase in risk was 26%. And this finding was not discussed at all in the conclusion, just buried in obscure text never to enter the scientific discourse. So what these three studies show is the potential harms of consuming readily oxidised oils. And this also extends to fish oil, which is usually oxidised right out of the bottle. If you want your necessary omega-3 and omega-6 fats, both of which are highly polyunsaturated, you best get them from fresh food. And as far as saturated fat is concerned, the evidence would conclude it is not dangerous. Now, there has been a lot of noise about the need for ventilators for coronavirus patients. And while it is true that ventilators are essential for some, they are not a magic bullet. In fact, based on the latest figures from the UK, only about 4 in 10 patients who get a ventilator will actually go home alive. So anything that can be done to assist those patients on a ventilator is clearly welcome. And the content of artificial feeding to ventilated patients is certainly one of those. Patients on ventilation can be fed through several different routes. This includes a nasogastric tube up the nose passing into the stomach, or even a catheter into a vein which delivers nutrition directly into the circulation. The problem is, the feeds that can be administered this way would usually pass for highly processed junk food. Do glucose and vegetable oil really need to be the main ingredients in this feeding formula? And this leads to a problem. 
While the benefits of blood glucose control in managing ventilated coronavirus patients is obvious, this is near impossible using standard feeding formulas. And we see the consequences of these formulas on things like liver function. Here you can see the progressive liver dysfunction that occurs with artificial feeding, a consequence both of high blood sugar and oxidised oils. Fortunately, we now have an increased awareness of some of these issues, and this paper found a reduction in 24-hour mean glucose levels from 205 to 143 milligrams a deciliter, or 11.4 to 7.9 millimoles a litre, after switching from a standard formula to a low-carbohydrate monosaturated fat formula. Here we can see the variability on standard formulas, which significantly improved when the carbohydrates and the oxidised oils were removed. And we also see low carbohydrate enteral feeding translate into improved outcomes for critically ill patients on ventilators. This study from 1989 found that patients on low carb feeding were able to come off ventilators on average 62 hours earlier than those on high carb feeds. And there was also a trend to reducing oxygen requirements prior to weaning as well. And while this is not conclusive evidence for what might happen to ventilated coronavirus patients, it should certainly give us food for thought. And I'd suggest that it may not be a strict requirement to use commercial formulas. With the cooperation of medical teams and dietitians in hospitals, there's no reason why low carb formulas consisting of good amounts of protein and low in oxidizable fats could not be formulated. Certainly, the use of homemade formulas is common in many countries around the world, and they need not be complex. For instance, this paper reports that as a part of a high egg diet, patients were fed 10 eggs overnight through nasogastric tubes. So in closing, I would argue a healthy diet is essential for a healthy immune system. And if you're not optimally healthy, now is the time to act. Change your diet, reduce the carbs, avoid oils, eat eggs, don't be afraid of meat. The science is there and your health depends on it. Thank you.